Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. Ed Roland, the singer of Collective Soul, and I have been friends for probably about 20 years or so. In case you don't know Collective Soul, they've had seven number one rock singles, including these. Ed stopped by the studio a couple weeks ago to catch up. I haven't seen him in forever. Here's our chat. Ed, welcome. Thank you, buddy. Thanks so for having me. So we uh, have known each other for, oh my God, I don't even know, 20, 20 years 20-something years, yeah. yeah. It's great to see you. You too, bud. One of the things that I always heard about, but I've actually never asked you about, is how Collective Soul, or how you actually got started. Was it a songwriting demo or something? Yeah, it was, uh, I used to work at Real to Real Studios. It mm -hmm. was in Stockbridge, Georgia. Will Turpin, who's the bass player in the band, yeah. Bill on the studio. And when I came home from Boston, I said, well, I want to be a songwriter. So I went in there and I just interned till uh, the engineer got a gig in Nashville. So Bill immediately said, well, it's your turn. And you know, you just sit there weeks, months, hours, just sitting there till they needed coffee or clean the bathroom, you know, just waited yep. my turn. And so during that time, that's I just learned production. I was engineering, how things worked. And then when the studio had downtime, I would then basically, you remember analog tape, you couldn't use all, you, there'd be 31, maybe 32 minutes on the analog tape. Yep. And this was a 16, started out as an eight track and then a 16 track machine Bill had. So when people would leave at the end of the sessions, I'd start splicing the tapes together, so I had a whole reel of 30 minutes. And I did that for about <laughs> Wait, five years. Were you using unused tape and, and... Well, at the end of it, there was it was like two minutes sure. left, and they couldn't put a song on it, sure. so they would go, session's over. I'm like, cool, so I got two minutes. that. I would splice it off, and have two minutes That's of tape, and then I I'll wait that. for the next session. So I had 30 minutes of tape, and I just started doing demos, just trying to figure out, you know, that craft. I didn't know how to write. I, I was just starting, and, and learning the production side of it, too. So, hence an allegation was literally a five-year period of demos, which I had about 30, but I think I put 10 or 12 on there, you know, and it was eight tracks, 16 tracks. Like, literally, I would mix it to where, you know, back in the old school days, tambourine would be on there with a kick drum, but you knew how to move it sure. and manipulate yeah. the faders. So, because when Shine came out, it was done on an eight track, and so they wanted somebody to remix it. And I didn't even have a track sheet just because I was there by myself. So he's like, I was like, dude, I can't help you, man. It's eight tracks of craziness going on. Lead solo would be over, you know, with lead vocal, you know. It's just, yeah. just Where you had room, you put the you things. You put something. Yeah. But, you know, I knew, how to, I knew where it was because I worked kind of quick on it. And then, yeah, so it was just a batch of demos, and I was trying to get a publishing deal. I had a guy, a manager that was kind of helping me. And sent it to everybody, sent it to radio stations. And my brother Dean, who's in the band, was going to Georgia State at the time, him and Will. And they had like a little frat band. And Shane, our original drummer, was in that band too. So every Sunday night, uh, Alma 88 would play local music. So I gave a well, cassette. Well, Alma 88 is the alternative, the alternative the college station correct. right here. Yeah. And they were ones that played, you know, progressive music at the time in the 80s and 90s that I would have never heard from the REM to the Cure yeah. police. Yeah. So they were very broad spectrum, but every Sunday night they would do locals. And so I gave it to my brother, Dean, and um, they started playing Shine. And the next thing we know, they called us and said, do y'all want to play the Christmas party? And I was like, sure. And I didn't have a band. So I called my brother and I said, hey guys, learn three songs, you know, <laughs> and we're doing the Christmas party for album 88. This was 1993. Okay. And we got up there and played Shine five times and three other songs of mine. <laughs> and people just went nuts. It was just like, you know, it was crazy. Crazy time. And the next thing we know, uh, WJRR in Orlando, the first uh, public radio station, yeah. played it. And Huge they call, called us to go down there yeah. and to play. I was like, all right. Well, it was this was February. And um, unbeknownst to us, 
Jason, Jason Flom from Atlantic, was fly, people were flying in all of a sudden, we didn't even know. And uh, as we were driving down there, you know, they had their top five at five, we're listening to JR, and I'm like, one day, boys, we may get this, because in two months, we were getting offers all over the place, the song was charting, and they were like, you know, number five was STP, four, Nirvana, Smashing Pumpkins, King's X, and number one, Collective Soul. And we were like, <laughs> what exactly is going on? Right. And then we got, I flew from there to New York, signed with Atlantic, then we went and played Woodstock, 94, and then we're on tour with Aerosmith, and we're all just looking at each other going, how did this happen? Okay, so so let's go back to that that original version of Shine. Was that your mix then? Yeah. I engineered mix, played everything. Uh, uh, the drums were that. You remember those, uh, they called them cats? Yeah. The, the, you, I would just play that because I didn't like my drumming at the time, and I'd just sit there and drum beat it and put it down that way. Great guitar tones on there. What would you have been playing? Uh, it was... Uh, Gosh, it's, it was a Yamaha. I only had one amp and one guitar. It was was a that the Yamaha one that, that had the, the it's game? A, that's what's, a, Soldano. what's the guy's Soldano? Yeah. The one that it was he. 112. Yeah, so it's basically like a Soldano. It was. Yeah. I think it even had his name on there, but it's Yamaha's. And yeah. uh, effects thing. That's why in Shine, I was trying to get something cool, so I went and emptied the toilet paper dispenser and had that and would go, yeah. <laughs> So that was my effects. No way! Yeah, that was my effects. I just came up with different things I had to. It was just me in a basement. And, um, I, I, you know, it was such a blur. Uh, Matt Sterletic came in there at the end because he and I were real tight. And um, he would come in because I was like, man, I'm getting burned out. Like, he'd help. Like, he played some keyboard stuff for me. And we did the arrangement on a song I wanted to show, because I was just trying to get a songwriter deal. I was, there was no band. Was okay, just, wait, so how's this connection with Matt? How did you know Matt? Uh, his jazz band used to come record it reel to reel. Okay. Oh and we God. just hit it off. Like, we just, like, he wanted to go into music. I mean, me and my parents got in a car and drove down to the University of Miami when he graduated. That's how tight we were. We worked in, uh, we did uh, lawn care, cut grass, and the... Two weeks before he got signed, he had, he'd, he'd already gone on a cruise ship playing trombone, and he said, do you want a gig playing guitar? I was like, I got nothing else going on. So two weeks before he got signed, he and I were heading on a cruise ship somewhere in the Caribbean to play music. Because we knew he just wanted to play music. Yeah. You know, He thought at some point he was just going to end up being a teacher, which he's great at that. And then we just continued on our path together. It was fun. It's kind of funny that you know, within that whole little time, he goes on to do, of course, Matchbox and Edwin and runs Virgin and we had our little thing and it's just been really great. Actually, I sent him a new record last week. I like to hear what he thinks. He give me his constructive criticism. And I tell him that, I said, constructive criticism, <laughs> Matt. So how did you put the first record together when you got signed? Tell me about the It was process. the same thing. Because we thought we were gonna get to go in and we thought it was, you know, woo, record deal. We get to go spend pre-production and like figure out what we sound like because it was, to me, the first one's just all over the place. Yeah. It's just songwriter demo. Yeah. It's all over. It doesn't sound coordinated at all. So. And whose idea was it to put that out, though? Was it Atlantic's? Was it Jason yeah, Flom's yeah, idea? Atlantic. They were like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, because we'd already That's charted. Which, which is actually unusual. Very unusual. And they were like, it's not broke, don't fix it. But we'd already charted. Yeah. So at this point, Atlantic was going through turmoil, who was going to be president. So we were out touring. So I was like, we got to figure this out, because... If one of the guys was going to be president, it was already told that he was going to drop us. And we didn't even make a record yet. So I came to this great idea that I'm going to write every day, and whatever day we have off, well, we use every sound check for pre-production for the second, which I consider our first, the, you know, the collective soul. And I, so I would write, and we'd go over them in the sound check, and if we had a day off, we'd go in and record. So I got it done in six months, so they couldn't, whoever was going to be in charge, I was like, here's our new record. And it just so happened that it you know, worked out good, for us anyway, and, and Atlantic too. So from then on, it was kind of smooth sailing for a little bit. When did it occur to you that this was, this was going to be your career then? Oh, I Once knew that song. when I was 14. Okay. Somehow I'd be doing this. My wife asked me that question all the time, and I, I, I love this answer. She goes, will you ever retire? And I always go, define that. You know, retirement's where you travel, you meet interesting people, you have a hobby, you love your life. I said, I retired at 14. That's literally, <laughs> I'm retired. I'd like to take a second to talk to you about this channel. 
This is actually Rick Beato too. I've had it since the beginning of my main channel and many of you are not subscribed. As a matter of fact, 87% of the people that watch this channel regularly are not subscribed. So I encourage you to hit the subscribe button on this channel and on my main channel. This will help me get even more of my dream guests and help continue to grow both channels. Thank you. I met you when you would go to Tree Sound here in mm -hmm. Atlanta. Everybody would talk about, oh, Ed punches in his own vocals and mm -hmm. stuff and runs, because you were an engineer. Correct. Like, to me, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Well, it was quicker that way, and it wasn't until Sean Grove came in on board, because yeah. I never felt comfortable. Sean Grove just brought in a, uh, an ease over me and confidence in my singing, because I was just so, you know, I don't have a normal voice, and it was, Hard for me to get used to, to be honest with you. Uh -huh. <laughs> for years, I'm cool with it now. But at the first, I was like, God, it just sounds so weird. The tone, it's just different. And that's okay, that worked in our favor, but it wasn't until Sean came in, he goes, man, just just relax and sing the songs and I'll help you through it. And he's he's been absolutely wonderful. Like I just sit there and he'll go, I don't think so. And I'll try to get away with it sometimes. Like, I just nailed that and he goes, hmm. I don't think so, Ed. Here we go. <laughs> he goes right back so, into it. So Ed and I were talking. So Sean is an old friend of mine as well. And we were just talking about this. I haven't seen Sean in forever. And when you were doing this stuff, when you were actually recording your own vocals at, at Tree, I was thinking, like, it was just such an, a weird thing to think that people would do that themselves. But yet that's so Well, that's, so well, that's also how I grew up. Yeah. I mean, because I was by myself. So yeah. I would sit next to the tape and just go, here we punch. Punch out, you know, the double double finger, record, stop. And then, you know, I got creative back in the day. I would find a chorus I liked. I was like, God, I just don't have enough time. I don't know if I can sing it that well. So I record it to a two, the little quarter inch two track, and get the grease marker, wait for that second chorus to come in, punch it, hope it's on time, and start flying stuff around like, like we do now on Pro Tools, but I was doing it back then on oh, tape. Okay, so when you were interning and learning how to record, is that where you learned how to mic guitars and things like that, mm -hmm. mic drums? Yeah, and I did a lot of study on that stuff. You know, I, I still do. I went to, uh, a friend of mine knew about the Stones when they did, um, which one was it? Tattoo You. Mm -hmm. I was like, how did Charlie get that snare sound, like that flangey thing? So he sent me diagrams of where they recorded and how they did it. And what it is, it's the flange coming from the monitors they would play. So every time he hit that, it would give it that flange sound. I was like, they didn't, they didn't care and it sounded cool as Christmas. Sure. It was just interesting. I just tried to do as much studying as I could. You know, the whole measure, the overheads to hear, that whole triangle thing. You know all about that. Yep. Wackiness. Now I'm like, just put the mic up there and hit the drums hard, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> if you want the drums heard, hit them hard. What makes a hit song? Would you know when you wrote one? Because you had no, so many hits. No, I, I don't. I think melody strikes people first because it's the easiest thing to catch on. And sometimes you can't understand the lyrics depending on how, where they mix them or how they want it mixed or even the accent, you know, having a southern accent. Some people don't understand. And then I think if you can add lyrics in there where they start singing, it's, it's, it's both. But I think the first, it's, it's no different than to me meeting your wife. First thing you're going to notice is the visual. You have to be attracted physically like that. And then you find their heart. So to me, it's kind of that way. It's melody, then you find the heart, which are the lyrics. Okay, you also have great guitar riffs. You've Thank always you. had great guitar Thank riffs. You. And and to me, your guitar riffs are just as hooky as, as your vocal melodies Thank are. Thank you, I love that. How would you work on riffs? The hard part, like I, I could sit around and noodle. I noodle yeah. all the time. Yeah. And I go, oh, that's a cool riff. Now how do I make it fit into a song, you know? And um, I, I go back to, like, the people that I grew up listening to, like, from uh, the cars. Elliot Eason, to me, is like, to me, his solos are the best. And I tell any lead guitarist when we've had three, and I, each one I'll go, listen to this cat play a solo. It needs to be as memorable as the melody. And he was just, to me, the master of it, you know? Gibbons does the same thing, yeah. you know, in blues. And, you know, these are the heroes that I looked up to. And I just, the riff thing, I don't know. I think I always said, you know, I listen to so much of the cars. I think I took Greg Hawk's keyboard riffs and just kind of made them into guitar riffs. I don't know. Okay, so we need to actually get you a guitar because I want you to demonstrate a few things here. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, so we just took a break for a second for Ed <laughs> to, get his, to get Ed's guitar mic'd up. So I was like, so... Do you know how many times I've taught the December uh, riff 
And, and he's like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, so Ed starts playing it. And I Ed, was playing it wrong. And he's playing it wrong. And so I'm sitting here say, thinking like, do I have to tell <laughs> <laughs> You did, he got his phone out. I got my he phone out. He played the original just, and he's like, you're not playing it right, Ed. I mean, I knew he wasn't playing it right, but I didn't want to say it. it in, I haven't played that riff in and a so, decade at least. And I just come I thought, in on the acoustic. Okay, so. am I gonna ask Ed to take his, can I use your guitar for a second and can I play it for you? So, so here's how I was playing it. <laughs> Which is an easy way to do it. And then guitar teacher Rick over here was like, no, here, 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 here. So it's supposed to go. <laughs> Shit, I couldn't do it. <laughs> you got me all confused now, Rick. Ed. Okay, Ed. Ah. <sighs> <sighs> Drink the water from my hands. Contagious as you think I am. Okay, so this, let's talk about this riff here mm -hmm. for a minute. This is such a great riff that is so recognizable. When I used to teach it to people, they were so psyched because it was something that they could play without even singing. Right. And everyone knew what it was. That's awesome. And it, to be honest with you, it was the only song that we ever fought as a band. When I played it for the guys, they were like, this is the worst thing. And it's like most boring. And because I wanted to write a song where the chord progression never changed okay. and to do melody. So the first verse, and you get the chorus. Yep. And the second verse comes around, you start adding the strings. So, and the who's and all of that. So when we came to the very end of you crescendo with four different melodies floating around. So it's hard to do that with one mouth while I'm playing that. They were like, you just play the same chords for four minutes. This is boring, Ed. I was like, no, no, just hear me out. Just hear me out. And it's the only time I we ever were like, it's like, trust me, guys, trust me. We're like, no, it's just boring. Okay, so I want to play the original. It's it's in a it's in a key. It's it's, it's, a it's half actually step up. half step up. So it's in standard tuning. Because there's other things about the track, like the the drums. Everything sounds there's so space. good. There's space. There is. Okay, we like so. space. You're doing all the vocals, right? The high vocals? Sean calls that chicken voice. Okay. <laughs> There's a story to get to this. So I'm trying to bring that, in different that, melodies. That's it's, another hook. Once again, you have all these guitar hooks in addition to the well, to, That's what I was to trying to do with the song. But like I said, I couldn't sing it to the guys. I was like, there's going to be four different melodies at the end. And that they they hung in there with me. <laughs> no, chicken voice is Sean's favorite thing for me to do. Okay, what is chicken voice? I told the story one day when I was first dating this girl in high school. You know, I was trying to impress her. You have the radio on and I, you don't sing in full voice. You're like, that's how to love. She's like, why do you why do you sing like a chicken? <laughs> so I tell the guys that, and they're like, yeah, you sound like a chicken. I'm like it's squealing over there. I was like, okay. So it's called chicken voice. So there's, but there, I think there's, is there two or three vocals in there? You got a high vocal. You have a low. I believe so. And you have some type of effect on the guitar, like a little, mm -hmm. tre a little tremolo, a little we mellow a, tremolo. Remember Diaz back in the day? He had that tremadillo. Yes. That's he had just given us that, and that's that's what we used on that. I remember that. Okay, where that did thing. you track this? Uh, Criteria. Okay. Which is, I guess, what's it called now? Hit Factory of Miami, I think in it's Miami, called yeah. that. I think so. Yeah. But we're in Miami, so. Okay, so why did you go down there to track it? Uh, the history of that studio. You know, you, you go sit in there, play foosball, and there's the Allman Brothers, James Brown Masters, I mean, multi-tracks. Um, you know, there's Layla, 
Eric Clapton. It was just, I just knew the history and I was just like, if we're gonna go do something, let's have fun. Okay, so you as a former engineer, producer, when you're working on your own record, are you thinking about sounds in addition? Like when you're tracking the drums, are you thinking about all this stuff too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like that's, like that's, you have a certain sound that you want the drums to have. Everything. Yeah, we'll talk about it as a band, especially now because we record as a band. We don't. Mm -hmm. We Johnny, our drummer, sets up and we horseshoe around him and we go for it. If that's the way I want to do it. And it's, you know, we got away from that for a second. You know, we started off as a band, and then we kind of went, well, just send it to me, and I'll do my part and just just started losing a little bit. And now with this lineup, we first off love being around each other and love playing, so it's real easy. Um, I'll sit down with them. When I show them a song, I'll say, it kind of feels like what was influencing me at the time, but you know, like a Jeff Lynn, Tom Petty record. And I'm like, let's, you know, the it could be the acoustic or slide, I don't know. Yeah, we sit down and talk about it first. And then we learn, take about an hour, learn the song and then no more than five takes, three takes, usually it's done. I want to revisit this thing about them not wanting to do this song that didn't change, the, the, where the chord progression didn't change because they thought what? They didn't, because they didn't have the they vision it was that you boring. had. Right, <laughs> but I couldn't sing it to them. I could give them the, you know, the verse, chorus, but hearing the other parts I was hearing, not just yes, vocally. it's more of an additive production. Correct, then. you know, I think it was XBC <clears throat> had a song back then that I listened to, it was just one chord, one riff, basically, but they, built it to where it was kind of the inspiration. Tom of, Petty, Tom how Petty? many of his songs have, yeah. have just four chords in them? Yeah. I mean, but they got it at the end. And we enjoy playing it every night. We prolong it just to just, you know, show off his guitar proudness. So we have fun with it. Okay, so another riff. I think I know that one. Okay, so how's that? So when I first was doing it, I remember doing that. That droning type yeah. thing, and I was, and the guys were like, uh, they heard me playing, and we're like, you know, we're kinda, you know, we don't wanna get into, it. nothing wrong with it, you know, like Alice and James. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, let's just go chromatic. It's just a chromatic run up. And they're like, okay, that's it. <laughs> I was like, okay. Okay, actually, I'm gonna play it here so we can hear it. Okay, so even those single notes that go boom, boom, the fact you just go to single notes in there mm -hmm. to me is. That's my Mick Ronson. That's a great arrangement. That's a Mick Ronson thing. thing. Mick Ronson call thing. It, that's what we call it. I'm like, Dean, do the Mick Ronson. You know, that so single note that he did all the time with Bowie is just so effective. Yeah. Help the song move. Yeah. Instead but of just, also the, the, when you go to the chorus, so you have a lot of moving things going on in the, in the verse. You have the tremolo thing that the effect, right? Mm -hmm. And then the this linear part, but then the, the verse you go to more of the held chords, right. which opens it up. Right. That's what we're trying to do. Right. And also there's no cymbals in that song. Okay. Always, uh, we were you in a Peter Gabriel phase or something like well, that or what? No. Uh, the drummer was to me getting lazy. He was just playing cymbals everywhere when we're learning the song. It's like, dude, chill out, give me a groove. Just give me this song needs a groove with that riff. And he was being, not difficult, just to me getting lazy. Everything was like, you know, and I was like, you know, I remember crossing down my breath, walked in there and removed every symbol except the hi-hat. I said, now play the, play the part. <laughs> and that's when he came up with that cool, you know, snare riff. He was limited, but yeah. then, the, then the imagination had to take off instead of crashing everywhere. I'll never forget, I was talking to Bob Rock. He goes, what do you have against symbols? 
It was like, I love cymbals. I just didn't, at one point I thought, well, we'll just overdub them. But I was just trying to get him into the groove of the song. You're a songwriter who also really thinks about the arrangements, mm -hmm. right? So you're yeah. thinking about the drum part, you're thinking about the, the held chords there to sing over, because it opens up and it kind of alternates between those held chords and then going back to the riff. What makes the riff stand out more to me. Yeah. If you, you know, as, as far as the arrangement. Yeah. And I never thought of me as a riff player, but I mean, I do write a lot of riffs and I, I go back to like just my well, heroes. Well, let's talk about your, your, this riff here. Okay, so Ed, I taught this song a million times as well. You probably have to teach me again. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing a lot of songs with that droning thing. This was like 1988. Wow. I was doing a lot of those like. <laughs> so I mean, it was just all kind of craziness coming in, just playing a, the droning with different melodies. And that was the only one that uh, I actually came home to my parents' house and Dean was in there playing guitar. I was like, oh, wow, man. And I never had the chorus. It was just riffs all over the place I had. So I was like, hey, check this out. And I played that and he goes, that's cool. And I was like, okay. And then I wrote the chorus, which is simple chorus. Kind of a gospel -y vibe. Yeah, you very know? much. But I had all kind of... I can't even remember, like just different. I was just into that groove, doing riffs like that, and Sean stuck, stood out, I guess. So your process would typically be on acoustic guitar? Would you write these riffs on, on yeah. electric guitar? Or yeah, I would write some on electric, but you know, nowadays I travel so much. Yeah. If I have time, I love writing on the piano. Okay. Right now, we just actually, we're releasing our double album, but last year we went to a house in uh, Jekyll Island and I wrote a record on piano. I wanted to present it to the guys and it's piano and orchestration. Of course they added stuff on there, but I was really nervous. So we have that record coming out next year. It's just different styles, but it, I'm kind of limited when I'm on the road. It's the back of the bus and it's this. So, and it's easy because we go to sound check and I'll show Jeff, he was like, hey, check this riff, what do you think? Because there's riffs, I, they'll hear me in the, back and they're like, remember that, we want to do that tomorrow. I'm like, okay. So, like, what were some that, like. That drone thing. So they'll hear that and they'll go, let's keep working on that and let's play it in soundtrack tomorrow. And then they add their, their flavor in there. Okay, so typically when you write a song, how long does it take you to come up with the lyrics? Do you have do you have like syllables in mind with a melody? Yeah. And you write to uh, you write to basically whatever your melody is. I used is. to call it before Keith Richards stole it from me in his book. I used to call it vowel movement. Uh -huh. So I would it would help the guys know where the the <laughs> rhyming scheme was going to be. So yeah. it doesn't matter what came out. It was just yeah. the rhyming scheme. So it helped them understand the phrasing of the song, and um, you know. I can, I never ask how I write, when I write, but it comes pretty quick. I mean, the new record, I walked into uh, Elvis's house with the guys, I had 12 songs ready, and they recorded it in four days. And we had the house for a month. So I told him, I said, take a four day vacation, go, you know, Joshua Tree, go hike, play golf, what do you want to do? So from a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I wrote 10 songs. It just, just happened. But I was kind of inspired of hanging out in Elvis's house, you know, and it's just me and Elvis's house, they're all gone, and I'm like, this is cool, playing vinyl in Elvis's party room. So I, I don't know, I don't ask at this point, just happy it happens. So you were on Atlantic Records, Correct. right? Were you on Lava or Atlantic? Atlantic. Atlantic. He got Lava because he signed us. Okay, so you were on Atlantic Records until 
2000, 2000. 2000, yeah. Tell me about when Napster happened and what, what people said about Napster at the time. I believe, what Napster free to? I think they... Well, people were, were basically taking take stuff. It. College students were so taking it. So it was it. when Metallica went at them, you yeah. know, and it was a big deal. When we were, you know, we'd be on the bus and we were talking about it like, you know, what's the future hold? How are we going to get paid? Um, so I'll never forget, I went up to Atlantic Records to the president and I said, you know, what, what's... What, what are y'all, what's y'all's vision on the history, you know, with Napster and digital? And I'll never forget, dude, I, I can imitate it like yesterday. I guess, Ed, it's going to go away. <laughs> and I left that meeting, called my attorney at the time. I said, I want off this label. There's no future here. <laughs> I'll figure it out some way else. And we did. He said, one more record, greatest hits, bye. And we're like, okay. Did the industry then go the way that you thought it would be, or, or were you surprised? Oh, no, no. Yeah, it's, we've been, we were the first band to go independent. Yep. We, we were blessed because we had a You did a really well. We, we had a brand. You did People really well People knew who Collective Soul was, and if you went to That's radio, right. they're going to go, oh, New Collective Soul, they're not going to look at what label and yeah. all that. They're like, New Collective Soul. We had a brand. We had a lot going for us to be independent, and we could face the hurdles, what we thought we needed to face, and then... It was, uh, we were the first one to go to direct store like Target. We went with, did it directly with Target and Billboard wouldn't recognize us uh, because we went to one distributor. Distributor. A month later, Eagles come out, hell freezes over and they went straight to Walmart and Billboard changed. Yeah. They had to. Like it's just constantly staying ahead of the game. Um, now it's more for us. Of course, the streaming's great, I, I guess. I don't really keep up with it. But for us, it's more just kind of settling and playing live. We enjoy live. And to me, if you can't do it live, you shouldn't make any more records. And in the old school days, you do a tour to support the record. Now we put records out to support the tour. It's kind of gone backwards, which is great. It still keeps us busy, relevant to, to a degree. People still want to hear new collective soul, but you know they're going to hear what they grew up knowing. You're not going to go to the Stones and not hear Jumpin' Jack Flash. You know, right. they're going to play new songs, but they're going to play what got them there. And that's what we do. But it's fun for us, and it keeps us uh, vibrant to ourselves, you know, creating new music still after 30 years. Right out of the bat, you have this huge hit. Did you feel pressured to come up with hit songs then? Never. You know, there was that old saying. People would ask me about it back in the day, and they're like, you know, you have your whole life to make your first record and then a year to make the second one. I was like, are you kidding me? I can afford an apartment. I got a car. The world, from a financial thing, was just lifted off me because I had no home. I mean, I basically slept in the studio under the board, an old mm -hmm. Trident board, because it was warm. I'd get a blanket pillow, and that's where I'd sleep. And had no car to say. I mean, it was had a hole in it. You know, it just got me to and fro. And I felt like I'd won the, which I did, I won the lottery. So there was so much pressure. I didn't have to worry about going and doing a session. My job now is to write songs, and that's that was awesome. Still is. I really have no pressure. Just go write songs. Huh? Well, I remember when you got off Atlantic Records, then you were putting out records that were getting played on the radio again. Mm -hmm. And that was really not happening. People weren't doing that. This You were one of the first people that we I know that yeah. did that. Yeah. It, it, that, that would have been the most scared I was, to be honest with you, because, you know, everybody was like, we couldn't even find a manager at that point. When we left Atlantic, we had no manager. It was, one guy finally called back and said, I'll give it a shot. And I was like, thank you. After the, the millions of records that you sold. Could, nobody would even take my call. Be, okay, why, why would no one want to take a chance in a band that wasn't on a major label anymore? Well, if you're on a major label, the chances of selling a million were great. So you, you got a gross profit margin there that managers take a gross profit margin. Right. If you're independent, you sell 250,000, which we sold 400,000 when we went independent. We make more money, but there's a chance that you're not, but we netted more money than we ever did with a label. But to sit there and go, million, 400,000, it's a business. Let's explain to people, because this has actually been a thing that's come up recently in some of the videos that I've done about the actual music business. How much would managers make historically? 15 or 20%, Correct. right? And then your agent? Gross. 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 Okay. Agents, 10%. Gross. Okay. Expen Business manager, 5%. Gross. So by the time you walk on stage, 35% of your money's gone. Right. That doesn't include what you have to pay your crew and everything else. It's a really high risk, high reward, I guess you could say. But, I mean, 
it takes a lot of money to do shows and it takes a lot of money to make records too. You know, not yeah. as much as it used to, but it, you still. How much did records used to cost to make? I don't Hundreds think we. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Maybe we, not for you guys. No, we didn't. We never got. We one one record. We kind of went overboard just because. Because you we, could. We could, yeah. and it was ridiculous. Uh, we we would never go over 150. I don't think. Well, the first one was made in the basement. It did pretty good. It cost me nothing except right. You know, used tape. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Steal everybody's tape. I didn't steal it. It just was no use. They couldn't right. use it. Was, it. it was, uh, it was just two minutes of tape, unused, unused tape. tape. Yeah, I was helping the environment out, man. I was using it. And you burn that stuff. That's Talk stuff. about how airplay used to work back there, royalties and things like that, when you have this big song. Um, well, it was BMI or ASCAP, I guess. Yep. CSAC was in there a little bit. They started coming into the picture back then. Now you got Sound Exchange, which yeah. is basically kind of take it over what they used to be, to be honest with you. That's when you realize, or I realize, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And thank God I was a songwriter. <laughs> And I never, I never signed my publisher away. I kept everything. I just sold some of my catalog two or three years ago, but I kept it all during that time and the rights to my on, and the recordings. Tell people why that's important. Because basically, I remember they wanted fifty percent of my catalog, whatever I would write for the next seven years, and they offered me. I, don't, I know exactly what they offered me. It was three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I was already understanding how much I was making. And so I was like, I'm, I'm not doing that for 350 and get 50% away. So I just kept everything and I made everything. Just didn't take the upfront money. It was a gamble and a chance, but I really believed that, because we were starting to form as a band when that deal came up. And I was like, we can make this, we can make this work. Well, back then, publishing deals, they would take advantage of the facts that the band would be broke. Well, it was always a gamble because right. many times, most you of the time, were. it wouldn't. You, you were, were right. and it wouldn't pay off for the publishing companies. Right. Right? Correct. When you would be on tour and you talk to other bands, uh, what would be the percentage of bands that would be, if you guys would ever talk about this, would have signed publishing deals? A lot of them. I don't know many that didn't. What you did was unusual. Very. Worked out. It could have gone the other way, too. I mean, once again, you're talking about a kid that had nothing, $350,000 in 1994. I thought I won the lottery. I thought I could live forever. But I was sitting there going, I just can't do it. I couldn't do it. They, they were too... At that point, I was 30 years old, too. So I'd worked for 12 years trying to do my craft. I was like, I'm not giving it away for 350 right now. I just can't do it. So, Did I anybody didn't. say you're crazy? Not at all. My attorney at the time was like, let's, let's do it. He was like, a lot of money. And I was like, I know. <laughs> you can buy a house. You can buy a car. I was like, I know. But then but you, give away, you give away, so just to be clear to people, 50%. you give away 50% of mm -hmm. everything that you earn from, from your songwriting. For seven, seven years, or so, I forget what it was, seven records, seven years, but it was, uh, I call it one step back, two steps forward. In this case, one step back, about 21 steps forward. And, and, the, and the percentage of people at the time, most of them did put, signed away their publishing. They did. And then you have to think about it, most, most bands wrote as a band. So yep. they, are, they already gave 50% of which they only own 10% at that point if there's five guys that take yeah. songwriting credit. Yeah. It's not a lot of money at that point. I mean, it starts getting chopped up pretty quick. Yeah. People don't realize all the expenses that there are. And when you're touring, how much it costs to bring backline, to bring... Go fill a bus up with gas now. I mean, right. It's, it's, it's out there. And hotels aren't cheap, you know. And I'm, but I'm so lazy. I just stay on the bus the whole time. <laughs> Shower at the venues. I love the back of the bus. It's like my little apartment. Get a lot done, get a lot of reading, a lot of just noodling around, and so don't bother anybody. You would occasionally produce other other artists? I think I did a couple. We were talking about Need to Breathe. I think I did a yeah. couple songs with them. But, I, I, you know, I'm so busy doing Collective Soul. I really haven't, um, you know, I was supposed to do Matchbox 20. I was supposed to do Everyone Kane, and I gave it to Matt because I was in the lawsuit with the our first manager, and I got mad out of that contract, and he went on to do what uh, he did, great job, both those bands, artists, and then really no one's really asked. I've done a couple of young bands that I felt I liked, enjoyed, but no, nobody's ever asked. Okay, so this lawsuit that you're in, this is probably something you can't talk about, right? Because I, oh, I, I can talk a little bit about okay, it Okay, because I had heard about this lawsuit. Yeah, well, he just took all our money. And we were put on a hundred fifty dollar a week salary, and uh, 
we made a, this was after the second Collective Souls. So my dad, you know, was a minister in Stockbridge. He knew this guy that had a cow farm and had a cabin on it. And it had a wood stove that heated and it heated the small cabin in the house. So we'd move the furniture out and Shane came over and we had the, remember the old ADATs? Oh yeah. I had two of those, so I had 16, might have had three, might have had 24 tracks. Sync them up. And uh, we made discipline breakdown in a, in a cow barn, basically. And we weren't supposed to be doing anything, but it, it finally got settled and everybody moved forward. And then when we got time, it was so raw. And the record label finally was like, y'all wanna re record this? I was like, no, I think I wrote those songs and that's how I wanted them to sound. Like, I'm not saying it sounds like Nebraska or whatever, uh, four track that Bruce did, but it, it had a raw appeal, which is kind of where we were emotionally. And so I was like, no, let it go. So two out of the first three records were recorded in a cow farm house and a uh, basement. So the next one at Dosage is where I was like, no, we're gonna go to Criteria. We've earned it this, this time just to go to a nice studio and have fun and blow it out a little bit, which we did, have fun. And then you started, then you worked at Tree here in mm -hmm. Atlanta yeah. after that. We finished up dosage at Tree. That's when I met Sean and um, Paul Diaz. We were the first one in Tree. I remember me and who else was with me at that point? It might have been Will. In the when band. he just built it. When he, he just, just built, built it, it and we brought that Tree in. Okay, I so I have to say, I have to interrupt here. So Tree Sound is here in Atlanta, oh. and this is where I started basically as a producer. And Ken, who's working in the control room, has been working with me since 2000. I, he was an engineer there, and he's mm -hmm. been working with, with me since then. I met you there. Right. And people like Elton John, who mm -hmm. you're friends with and worked with, mm -hmm. would record there. Yeah. It's like the main studio. That and Southern Tracks were yeah. the two big studios. Two, two, yeah. I mean, we were there one time. Ariens in the next room over there recording. You know, it was just the who's who of rock music at that time. And it was, and, uh, and hip hop. Hip hop uh, took off, exploded. That's right. And Outkast would be in yeah. there. There'd always be big hip hop artists right. in there. Rock bands, hip hop yep. artists, everything, all m merging together. Merging together in Norcross, Georgia. Norcross, Georgia. Okay, so you finished that record at Tree. Did mm -hmm. you mix it there or no? Mixed in Miami. Okay. I think uh, Tom Lord mixed that record. Okay. And, and would you go down for that? Oh, yeah. Tom and I got along great. Okay. At first, he wouldn't let me in there. I was like, Tom, I'm not playing this game. I'd go in there. <laughs> I was like, I would just mess with him. He, I think he understood that I, I take it serious, but I'm not in there to complain. I was like, you need me to re-sing that word right there? Just to mess with him. I go, hey, can we just start with the kick drum again, bud? And just to just to watch him go, I'm like, dude, I'm just chilling. Tom is very Tom Lord LG We're talking about is who's a who's a legendary mixer. Him and his brother Chris. Chris, yeah. And Tom Tom mixed something for me at one time, one song, and it was perfect. All the balances, everything were perfect. I couldn't I couldn't complain about anything. And I'm a picky I'm a mm -hmm. picky person. Okay. But his attention to like what the proportion of the instruments were where the vocal sits I thought was really like right on so I got a funny story about okay. that so okay. we finished heavy and I sent it to the record label and they call me and they go the vocal's not loud enough can you put it up the 0.5 you know that whole story yeah so I put the phone on hold and I said Tom you think the vocal's too low he goes I mixed it <laughs> he goes hang the phone up I'll call Tom I forgot who mastered it uh yeah who was it can't remember it was in New York so he calls me and Ted says, Jensen, just, maybe or Ted something? Jensen. Okay. So Tom calls, calls, calls Ted and goes, send him the same damn thing. And <laughs> did it. Five minutes later, they call back and they go, perfect. <laughs> it's the same mix. Oh my God. These are Tom, the Tom was great about that. These stuff. are the classic stories that back, you hear. Yeah, back in the day. That's yeah. whatever. Yeah. Send them the same thing. You know, and they put doubt into artists because yeah, we're sounds, already, we're already better. insecure. We're artists. So we're insecure when they go, it's not loud enough. I'm like, Tom, he goes, I mixed it. It's perfect. And I was like, okay. Hang the phone up. I'm hanging. Calls Ted. It was, it was, he goes, he even said, watch this. I was like, oh boy. Send him the same thing. Send him the same mix. <laughs> Called back, said it's perfect. You always hear the stories about the A and R guys. I know you would never really had A and R people mm -hmm. show up at the studio, but the A and R guys would come to the studio and they'd be like, um, you'd have a fader for them. Yeah, here's a vocal, and then they, yeah, I think it needs to go up a little bit. They go up and push it up, and when it's actually not doing anything. I used to do that when I was an engineer, and they were like, because you, you had it right, and I knew the room, like, you know, 
whether it's guitar loud or whatever, you do that fake move, like your hand slides over the fade, like, what's that like? Ah, that's, that it. that's it, that's it, yeah, is that good? Okay, so Ed, what's the, uh, where's the place that you go to listen to know if a mix is right? On I what? got speakers everywhere. Sean and I run all over the room. We don't do cars anymore. Okay, because um, why? They have subwoofers, Well, I take it back, tell. we did do the car on this one because we did that, what's that mix that Apple's doing now? The that crazy, because we Atmos. listen to it, what's it called? Atmos. Atmos, Atmos. Yeah, we did that. Sean and I got in the, we listened on headphones and Sean almost lost his mind. He's like, this is, I don't understand what's going on. You know, then we got in the car and it sounded, we we're like, well, let's try the car. We haven't been in the car in years and it, it sounded cool. It's just different. Have you, have you done one of those yet? I've not done one, no. It's different. Yeah. Uh, but that's what they're moving to uh, for everything on Apple. Sean's got his little Bluetooth. I have mine. And then we, uh, yeah. You, you listen on the phone ever? Yeah. I do, because that's where everybody listens now. Yeah. What do you so, think about that? I don't mind it, but it's not full sound. You know, I'm, I'm just old school. Like I said, I, if, if I like something, I'm going to buy it on vinyl. I'll stream it just to have it if I have to listen to it on plane or something. But, I mean, I'm just a vinyl guy. When you sit down to listen to stuff, mm -hmm. you listen to vinyl. I do. And I'll get, I'll get the... I, I like the originals of my heroes, but if they remaster them and all that stuff, so I love hearing that too. But I, I, love, I love the old... Good stuff. Well, I love the fact that you're that you think of this like a producer and an engineer. You're beyond the craft of being a, a songwriter, that you have this appreciation for these other kind of the other hats that you wear from mm -hmm. from basically coming up as a studio person. Correct. And I appreciate like Sean, I couldn't you know, I don't touch anything anymore. Like Sean's we I always call him Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to man behind the curtain. He's just one and you know, working with somebody for 25 years now, he, he, we don't even talk to each other. It's like, you know, uh, uh, I got it. <laughs> you know, when you work with somebody that long, you know the quirks, ins and out. But uh, I, I refuse to touch anything anymore. But I know how everything works, you know. Yeah. You know, simple things, compression, you know, a little more reverb or like delay or, you know, try this or that. Try, you know, EQ the reverb for change, not just put reverb on there. EQ that reverb, you know. Well, you went in my control room. You know all the pieces of gear there. I know. Everything. I got jealous again because I sold all mine. It, was, it's, it's, it really is a beautiful thing to me. I, there's something spiritual about gear like that. I used to love just walk down there and look at it. Like I said, I wouldn't touch it, but I would just look at all my racks and just go, man. It, it was actually my reward, my reward awards or whatever for what I've done because I could afford that. It was just nice to have and look. I didn't touch it. Sean touches it, but it was just, I don't know. There's something it's about... It's like a platinum album back in the day. Like, I was like, a whole row of, you know, Neves and Focusrites and those compressors. I, I got caught up in compressions. I was all over the place. And and it was really satisfying to be able to buy that stuff. It was, that's time, what I'm saying. Right, like it's, yeah. I didn't want a car. Yeah. I, I just, whatever will get me to A and B and B by the A, that's cool, but I wanted all this gear. <laughs> like, it was just crazy. Mics. So now it's all been de deleted down to Half Rack and Apollo and those Townsend mics, which I really do enjoy those. And you're showing off these cool mics. It's my, cool. My, my KM84. Yeah. See, that might end up in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, would you like to sing a couple songs? Sure. Can we can we set them up you? to do that? Yeah, that'd be we'll great. Give them a mic. I'd love that. And Ed, you want to talk about what you're going to play here? Yeah, you, you know, you look for different ways to get inspired by songwriting. I do anyway, because it's I'm not the guy that wakes up at nine, gets a cup of coffee, and goes, "I'm going to write a song." I just wait for something to happen, and like I said, knock on wood, it happens. But this song, we were on tour. It's about a year and a half ago, and I wake up at like five or six because I'm kind of on daddy's schedule, even out there. I go to bed, the boys stay up, and they have a good time. Yeah. So I woke up, and I'm doing my pee break, and uh, Dean's up there listening to Tom Petty's Highway Companion, and it was Square One, which I just love that song. I was so excited he's listening to that record. I love that record. And I'll never forget, he goes, you need to write a song like this. And I was like, okay, let me go pee real quick, and I'll get to work on it. So he inspired, he challenged me, you know, in his own way, challenged me. So I wrote this. This is uh, called A Letter For Me. I can't wait till the stars collide 
patience has never been a friend of mine And this soul in which I do reside Lays me down in peace every night I know that time's not easily found I don't have time in my pocket Cause time never sticks around I can love you more than I love you now I've watched the sun rise to watch it set One summer just to hedge that bed Nothing lost is nothing gained I accept But knowing you I'll never ever regret I know that time's not easily found I don't have time in my pocket Cause time never sticks around See, I can't love you more than I love you now I can love you more than I love you now. Beautiful. Thank you, Dino, for challenging me. Beautiful. Thank you. You know, it's got that petty vibe. You know, just plucking away. Love it. For this song, the true story. Okay. It's where I know. But the last day of recording at Criteria. I'll never forget. Greg Artilla was engineering that. I don't know. You remember Greg Artilla? Yeah, of course. Yeah. It was the last day. We were just finishing up stuff. We were going to go do something for MTV and then straight to Clear Mountain to mix. And I said, I just hate that song. I can't figure it out. I don't know what it is. So I had the music bed and I rewrote the lyrics and the melody to the music bed. I was just driving myself nuts because we've been going so hard. You know how it sometimes oh, yeah. at the end of the session, you really start losing perspective of yes. everything. Yeah. And I was losing my mind on that song, and I could see Greg just sitting there going, he was appeasing me, you know, appeasing me, if that's the correct word. Finally, he goes, dude, what, what in the hell are you doing? And Greg's voice, you know, boy, what the hell are you doing in there? I finally said, I give up, but I would love to find that recording. I finished it and just rewrote World I Know, then it went on to do what it did. So thank God Archilla was in there to get on to me anyway. I conscience shown past the sweet breeze blown past all kindness gone hope still lingers on I drink myself a newfound pity Sitting alone in New York City And I don't know why Are we listening? I'm soft offering And have we eyes to see Love is gathering Now all the words that I've been reading Have now started the act of bleeding into I walk upon high and I step to the edge to see my world below and to laugh at myself 
As the tears roll down It's, it's the world I know It's the world I know Yeah, I walk upon high And I step to the edge To see my world below And I laugh at myself As the tears roll down It's the world I know It's the world I know Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, Ed. It's been such a pleasure. Man, we can't wait ten you. more years anymore. Like this, I know buddy. it's been been way too long. We'll thank you dinners. so much. Thank you so much for coming by and hanging out. Everything, buddy. It's awesome. Bro. So great. And I like your shoes, by the way. Thank you. We match. <laughs> <laughs> like to once again thank Ed for being my guest today. Leave a comment. Hit subscribe. Thanks for watching.